outside is frightful, but my snuggles are so delightful. Where's your holiday spirit? Fine, I'll stop singing and the hat comes off. Welcome back, cool cats and cat allies alike, to Six Degrees of Cats, the world's best and only cat-themed culture, history, and science podcast. Gather round, cats and kittens, for a tale that will chill you to the bone. Long, dark nights, crones, trolls, 12 to 13 hooligans running wild in the village, child abduction, and a monstrous giant cat. Yes, it's that time of the year. Halloween. Halloween. Just kidding. Feliz Navidad. Merry Christmas! In this episode, we'll be talking about cats and Christmas. Specifically, a very unique kitty from Iceland, who is one of the most fascinating holiday characters I've ever heard of. The Yule Cat. But first, if we're going to understand the Yule Cat, we gotta know the reason for the season. As of December 21st, we'll officially be in Capricorn season, if you follow the Western Zodiac, which, according to the estimated date on my birth certificate, is apparently my season. And, uh, I'm in good company here. Apparently, Jesus, the prophet deemed the Son of God in Christian faith, was a Capricorn, born on December 25th, per millions across the world, who celebrate his birthday on that day. Or was he? Hold that thought. According to my research, far before the time Christ was said to have walked this earth, folks actually were celebrating around that time, as in father time. Or, as he was named by the ancient Greeks, Kronos. And in Roman culture, Saturn. Lots of names here. Saturn happens to be the ruling planet for Capricorns. Have you heard of the word Saturnalia? Well, it's yet another festivity, Roman style. Going back in time a bit, these libations were an observance of the winter solstice, a time when the sun is at this angle that causes us to have the shortest day or the longest night. So yeah, for about a week around the 17th of this month, ending on the solstice, Folks partied, made mischief, wore funny hats, and played that hit Hasbro game, Knucklebones, using knucklebones for dice, something like that. Possibly over a diluted mulled wine, gifts were also given. Get this, the old standby of I don't know what to get you gifts, candles, and white elephant exchanges can actually be seen back in Roman times. The celebration was to honor Saturn, the god of the harvest, to bring on the promise of a happy, healthy, harvesty new year. Sound familiar? Oh yes, my sharp six degrees of cats listeners. What the Romans were doing, you probably do in some way, shape, or form, willingly or not, (laughs) with or without family and friends and colleagues. Cultures across the world have observed the winter solstice, and in these modern times across the globe, one of the most influential holidays is Peebo Bryson Day. Come on, y'all. Christmas. So how did the winter solstice and Saturnalia transform into Christ's birthday on December 25th? Well, turns out December 25th may not actually have been when Jesus was born. In my research, I surfaced a few discussions that suggested his birthday was actually like March 20th or April 15th or May 21st. Obviously, they didn't have airtight, you know, medical documentation at that time. So, Jesus may have been a Pisces, Aries, or even a Taurus, Gemini, because the constellations might be adjusted. Not exactly astrology is an airtight science. This speaks to the point made by our religious scholar expert, Dr. Megan Goodwin, from the Witches episode. That prior to the church, 501c3, per U.S. tax code, there were probably as many denominations or little pockets of Jesus worshipers as there were households until the church, 501c3, 
made it a corporate holiday. It all started, or maybe just took off, when Constantine, the Roman emperor of the 4th century, mass decreed Christianity permissible. And then the commercial campaign furthered with Pope Gregory I, Not the cat here. who decreed that December 25th was the date for the holiday. Or maybe it was before then. The documentation is kind of muddy on when someone said, let's make December It's all about marketing, folks. Anyway. What is documented is that it was in the church's best interests to work within the existing holiday calendars of the cultures they were uh, colonizing. Let's put it that way. And this is really evident in Iceland's Christmas or Yule time traditions. Yule as in Yule log? So Yule was basically what the Saturnalia parties were called, as carried on by various Germanic tribes including the Vikings, who loved cats. And Yule is related to the word Yule for solstice in Old German or something. Norse and Old English. You hear that Yule cognate also in the word Yulnir, which is another name for Odin, one of the gods in the Norse pantheon, who stars in a lot of stories about what's transpiring during this cold, dark season of long nights. And who happened to be portrayed in Norse mythology as an old man with a white beard. We're getting to the cat part, I promise. We were talking about the Yule part of Yule Cat. Yule being the word referring to winter solstice seasonal gatherings in Nordic and Germanic cultures. Let's get a little more history on this. Definitely. So... Yule, or Yule in Icelandic, Yule in Norwegian, uh, Yuletide in English, is a very ancient festival, of course, pre-Christian. The word might be associated with the word hjol, which means the wheel, almost the wheel of the year, the turning point of the year. In Iceland, especially at Christmas, the sun comes up at maybe uh, 10.30 in the morning, 11, and then starts going down about 2 o'clock, 2.30. So darkness is is very powerful. And their food reserves are beginning to go a little bit low. And they're looking forward to the days becoming longer again, for the sun returning at some point. So really, this is what's being celebrated. It's the longest night. You might recognize our returning expert on Icelandic and Norse folklore, University of Iceland's Dr. Terry Gunnell. I've always been interested in history and uh, folk traditions, folk festivals, and things of this kind. It goes back to my doctoral thesis, which was really about the beginnings of drama in Scandinavia. And that involved looking at all sorts of folk festivals that involved people dressing up in costumes, which may have had very ancient roots. Thanks to my great discussion with him, I learned, or rather unlearned, a lot about Iceland, such as the fact that Prior to the arrivals of the Viking ships with their slaves, there actually weren't any indigenous people on this island. This is what makes Iceland and the Faroe Islands, which isn't so far away, very different to really anywhere else in this part of the world, certainly. Apparently, there were a few hermits who'd come up here from Ireland, and they disappeared pretty quickly because there were obviously a lot of people moving into the country. The men simply grew old and died. But there was otherwise nobody here. And that meant that people coming to Iceland and to the Faroe Islands where there was nobody was very different to, say, coming to Scotland and the Scottish Islands where there had been a lot of people living before. Certainly the first main settlers that came to Iceland in the late 9th century were people largely coming from Norway. But they also brought along with them a lot of slaves from Ireland and Scotland. So probably there were even more people from Ireland and Scotland than there were from Scandinavia. They'd looked at the DNA of the Icelanders in recent years, and if I remember correctly, I think the female DNA is at least 50% from Scotland and Ireland, and about 30% of male DNA comes from Ireland and Scotland, so they're more Nordic. This means that the traditions that we have in Iceland are kind of a little bit different to those from Norway and Denmark, and there are touches of of stories and uh, beliefs that come from Ireland as well. Iceland's unique setting, climate, and history set the stage for those tales to foment into some pretty unique cultural phenomena. 
Dr. Gunnell elaborates. Iceland was a completely empty landscape, and that must have been pretty frightening in many ways. When they were at home, they knew where they should bury their dead. They knew where they could give gifts to the supernatural, to the elves and the nature spirits. Came to Iceland, they had no idea even if the nature spirits spoke the same language they did. So they had to establish places where they believed that their dead would go after they died. They had to establish places where they lived and where the nature spirits lived, where the trolls lived and things of this kind. So in, in a sense, creating sacredness or sacred areas of the landscape, creating a sort of new religion to a certain extent. They have to be adapted to a country that has got, for example, boiling hot water coming out of the ground, volcanoes, earthquakes, smells of sulfur in many areas, pretty frightening all around. And so? Certainly in terms of heritage, of course, people are bringing with them their heritage from home. The Norwegian settlers bring their beliefs and their stories and their traditions. But the same with the Irish. The slaves there are also bringing their own traditions, which they'll be passing on to children when they're bringing them up. In all cases, adapting to these new surroundings. Only gradually, they become Icelanders and not Irish or Scottish or Norwegians. Thank you so much, Dr. Gunnell. Friends, we have covered the winter solstice and how Yule and Christmas kind of merged into the same week. Wait, who might that be? We're getting right into that after the break. Hold on to your socks, everyone. It's... Uh, come again? That was an Icelandic journalist who wrote about Jólakotrín. So, Jólakotrín is... It's the cat, the Christmas cat. I bet this cat is fluffy and huge like those gib cats that Molly Dowdswell told us about in the Vikings episode. The ones that Freya had in her sleigh. The folklore goes that there is an ogress called Grilla. Grilla also has a cat, you know, Christmas cat. And he's a big son of a, we call a female cat again? That would be a queen. Oh, so in Iceland, we call them Laida, and uh, a male cat is a press. He's a huge cat. Night, big claws, really piercing eyes. So I'm guessing Grilla is a bit of a different spin on Mrs. Claus here. She's certainly not a nice little old lady with a cat on her lap. She is not exclusive to Christmas. She'll come down from the mountains and she'll come and eat naughty kids all year round. And she is married to an ogre called Lapalume. He's basically like a big dumb ass. So Krila and Lepalud aren't Mrs. and Mr. Claus, exactly. But maybe they have elves and reindeer or something. I'm a bunch of children. Those are the Yule lads, anywhere from 9 to 13. I usually we stick to 13 right now. And they show up for the 13 minutes. So every night, kids put out their shoes and get a little treat. So it's exciting to wake up and also you're bad. You get a lump of coal, right? Kids will find an uncooked potato in their window. My uh, older daughter got an uncooked potato one day, refusing to go to sleep at the right time and whatever else. So there was a sort of message. I am starting to hear a few things that might be familiar to those of us raised to be good 364 days of the Gregorian calendar year. So we've connected Christmas to Yule. Let's continue trying to connect the Yule to the cat. Thanks to the Viking settlers. I was born and raised in Reykjavik and live there currently. Freyjökata is a street in the center named after this goddess, Freya, who was always associated with cats. People say the street is mysteriously always filled with cats, that cats are just like lingering around the street always. I encounter multiple cats every time I'm walking or I'm just, you know, strolling around downtown Reykjavik. So I would say Iceland is a lot more cat-positive place. That was our third guest and second Icelander. 
My name is Julia Hermarsdottir. I am a musician. I work in tech <laughs> and I love cats. Julia grew up hearing about you. Yola Kötterin, yeah. A huge cat who will eat you if you don't get clothes for Christmas. Wait a minute. The cat eats what? Economically disadvantaged children who eat you right up. If you don't get a new article of clothing before Christmas. Like a fancy wool sweater or something? You can just be like a pair of songs. I kind of thought Nordic cultures were, you know, not so materialistic. Wait, is this a ploy from the local sheep shearing union or something? Icelanders were so poor back in the olden days that, you know, the Christmas celebration, like some poor families were, would just be like, we can't afford to celebrate Christmas. We're not going to give presents to our children. It was like a persuasion technique to get poor people warm clothing for their children. Back in Icelandic society, rural society of the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, you have maybe 20% landowners and other people have no, no rights, really. They're farm workers moving from farm to farm, living on the farm with other people. And then, but they have no real right to get married. They have no right to own anything. They're being paid wages, but are often treated as being somewhat lower. That was only put an end to really when we're in the early 19th century, really. This tradition is making sure that even those people are given something new. New shoes, for example, made from sheepskin, something like this. Everybody gets presents of some kind. So I think that's part of it. I had a hunch that this big cat was misunderstood, just like all cats. However, I'm still not quite understanding how our little Felis Caddis friends got mixed up in this morality business. What's the root of this story? Did a cat steal a sock or something? Well, folks, it's all about the cat-goat connection. The what now? For the answer, we must revisit Grilla. Grilla was, in a sense, Iceland's first feminist because she sort of ate her first husband when she got fed up with him. She rules the roost completely up in the mountains. She's a sort of bugbear that's out there to make sure children behave and learn. She's not related to Christmas initially. She is much, much older. She's talked about in the 13th century in a poem, which describes her coming down from the mountains with a whole pile of tails on her. She's got these animal skins, and this verse is still used nowadays as Greelet coming onto the farm from outside, coming in from the wild. She has horns, she has cloven feet. She very much looks like a Christmas goat. Christmas goats? There were Norwegians in Iceland who had traditions of dressing up as the Christmas goat at Christmas time. The person who hasn't got new clothes will go into the Christmas goat is an expression that's also used across Scandinavia, meaning not so much that they'll be eaten by the goat, but that they will become the goat for Christmas. So in a sense, they are, they are the Christmas goat of the family this year because they haven't got any new clothes or they have to sit in a particular place. The expression they will go into in Iceland has come to be taken as they'll be sort of eaten by or swallowed by. A move between the goat and the cat is, is very strange. Grilla is called a figure in skins, which again brings us back to this animal-like figure and people dressing up in skins at some time of the year. So she's clearly related to the cat and she's clearly related to the goat figure especially. Grilla is one factor in Yolakotrin, not Yolagot. During See what I did there? And perhaps there's also a simple linguistic reason. Iceland is Hatnam goats, but the Norwegian word is unigait, which is very similar to Yola Kutter, if you hear the similarities in the words. And so maybe through a misunderstanding, then they start creating the being of the cat. All of these figures come down over the Christmas period, in a sense, ensuring that people behave in one way or another according to new social rules. I'm relieved that the origins of these folktales are not just marketing ploys to push the apparel industry in Iceland, which might have even included cat fur fashion because that was, as Dr. Prehall in our Vikings episode said, a thing. No, friends. As Hukur, 
Yulia, and Dr. Gunnell helped us understand. Yelakotrin and Krila instead remind us that we are accountable to each other. And when we don't look out for each other, bad things really do happen, especially to the most vulnerable members of our societies. Like kids, of course. I don't think Yolakotrin will ingest them if they don't get socks. But it's true. There were dire consequences for those early settlers on the remote, freezing, belching, steaming island of Iceland when they didn't help each other out with shelter, clothing, and food. And that translates into the here and now. If we look out for others and know that they have our back as well, Together, we're all going to make it through the long, dark nights during winter and beyond. Ah, the holidays. I no longer believe in Santa Claus, which was a very tough reality to face last year, but thanks for getting me through it, Binky and Snuggles. May we all take care of those in our communities, lest we enter the stomach of the Yule Cat. My dear Six Degrees of Cats listeners, may your winter solstice and all other holidays falling around this occasion be full of rest and connection. Speaking of which, Binky Snuggles and I will be taking a little break for my birthday season and will resume our fortnightly schedule in the new year. I'll share the dates and details for the next drop on the Captain's Log Substack, so if you're not already subscribed, please check out the link in our show notes and sign up. I want to thank my wonderful experts. Hey, Magnus. Terry Gunnell. Julia Hermarsdottir. While the opinions are my own, the research and work is theirs. If you'd like to learn more about them, please check out our show notes, which also include the references and research that went into this episode. Oh, and big thanks to my team, a.k.a. me, Captain Kitty, and my co-executive producers, Binky and Snuggles, for whom I'm eternally grateful. As always, if you loved what you heard, please give us a five-star rating and a review because that actually helps a lot. On behalf of the team, we wish you all a very happy new year. And remember, everything is connected. Six Degrees of Cats is produced, written, edited, and hosted by yours truly, Captain Kitty, a.k.a. Amanda B., Please subscribe to our mailing list by going to l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash six degrees of cats or look us up on all those social media platforms. You'll be first in line for the extra audio and more treats if you connect with us there. All episodes are dedicated to the misunderstood, the marginalized, the resilient, and the weird. And of course, all the cats we've loved and lost. In Iceland, witches don't have cats. So Iceland has this sort of um, spindle figure rather than a cat. Very odd beings that are associated with spinning and they sort of wind wool onto it and it feeds off their blood on their thighs somewhere and then goes out hopping across the landscape to go and steal milk.